we're happy that our guideline, which I said we, we wrote three years ago, is in line with those recommendations that were made by the IDSA and PIDS. The difference, I think, with our institutional algorithm is that we can be much more specific in what we recommend to our practitioners um, at our institution because uh, when there's a lack of a standard of care based on evidence, you can pick something that makes sense at your institution for those practices and suggest that as a starting point from which that can then be evaluated. Whereas on a national guideline, you can't really take into all the factors at each institution and make a very hard-nosed guideline about specific issues of management. Mm -hmm. So for instance, in the PIDS IDSA guidelines, there's a statement that both VATS and fibrinolytic therapy are acceptable. Well, at our institution, fibrinolytic therapy is just not used because of a variety of barriers and choices of the surgeons, etc. So it didn't really make sense to put in the guideline, you can use fibrinolytics or VATS. At our institution, if you were going to do the interventive procedure, the recommendation should be VATS. And that leads to a lot less uh, confusion amongst the care practitioners because they know in the ED, the question they're asking the surgeon is, please come in, would you evaluate this patient for potential VATS? And that leads to a lot of less confusion amongst the care practitioners and the families. Because you can imagine if a, a resident uh, or care practitioner in the ER went to the IDSA guidelines and it said you can use VATS or fibrinolytics, and then they're explaining both of those procedures to the parents if one is not even actually applicable at their institution. So they both work together. So I think the IDSA guidelines give a national consensus about what is really useful or not, and then those can be put into place at, in an individual institution based on the practices and capabilities of that institution. And I think this gets at, it's really important to have all the players that are involved in the care of these patients together in a room speaking. So the example I gave was um, when we looked first at why was CT being used so much compared to ultrasound, um, we asked all the different services, do you realize that there's data that ultrasound actually is preferable in distinguishing loculated empyema from simple pleural effusion? And actually, we were surprised. Most people knew that. Uh, so, so we were wondering, well, why is everyone still ordering a CT scan? And actually, the reason was that there was not ultrasound uh, technicians available at certain critical hours in the ER when these children were being admitted. So that led to the opportunity to invite the radiology colleagues in who immediately immediately said, of course, you should have, be able to get ultrasound. We didn't realize, you know, that this was such an important need. Um, and now we have that capability, and I think that was vital to getting the shift away from CT to ultrasound, just because on a practical standpoint, if you can't get the ultrasound, uh, you're going to order the CT. So a CT scan is a massive radiation dose, like 100 chest x-rays. Um, so anytime we can reduce radiation exposure in a child, it's, it's a beneficial thing. And in this case, it's not even the better test. So to administer radiation when it's actually not even the best procedure really doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, secondly, CT scans often require sedation for some of our smaller children where the ultrasound is usually re does not require sedation or less. Uh, so it, it's actually two-pronged as far as decreasing radiation and anesthesia needs, and in, it's actually a better imaging modality.